Good morning, Southgate. How are you doing? I got a couple people that's excited. I got two, I got three. I'm, I'm going, moving over to the, got one in the back. Got one, wait, 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 move over here. Do I, do I have somebody on this? I got college students. I know college students can get excited. Ooh, all right. Good morning, you guys. This has been a beautiful, beautiful week. We've had youth in here worshiping God, bowing down before their creator, hearing some real discipleship, some real ideas on how to grow spiritually. You should be happy. If your children, if your youth came here, I, I heard a year worth of stuff that I share with the dance group uh, spoken in 45 minutes to an hour in here. And all I said at the end of that, do what he said to do. And when pastor comes up here, man, do what he said to do so we can all come together. Have them, uh, have them times during the day, right? We spending time, not just in the morning. We going in the middle of the day, we going at night because we staying in his presence. Um, for those that have two and three year olds, guess what? The nursery is open! Woo! Send them over there. Miss Becky loves them to death. Austin, they got a dance, and maybe he'll teach them some dance moves over there. Um, who's here for the first time? Okay. Trust me. There'll be more. Be careful, y'all. So all of you that are here right now, there's some people coming next week that I want you to at least wave at them. Make sure you wave at them new people that come through the door, okay? And um, let's just get started. Father, we thank you. We thank you so much for the word that you're going to bring today through Jeff Grinnell, Lord God. Lord, I pray, God, just as our youth need to be disciples, we need to be disciples too. Help us, Lord God, not just to see your word, uh, even as we look at your word three times a day, Lord God, not just to see it, but to be doers, Lord God, so that we can see the blessing that comes from being a house that's planted on a rock, that we would never fall, even when the storm comes. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, we think you're faithful. Father, we give you praise and honor, not because of what we deserve to receive from you, God, but because we know who you are and what your presence represents. Father, we lift the name of Jesus and only the name of Jesus. And we thank you for the things that you have yet to do in our lives, Jesus. And I search the world. But it couldn't fill me With man's empty grace And treasures of faith Are never enough So you came along And put me back together Now is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, come on, can we sing this? And there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing. And nothing is better than you. Well, I'm not afraid, and I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Oh, I believe that the God of the mountain. The God of the valley. Come on, there's not a place 
And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. So you turn morning. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who cares. You turn grace into God. Turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. Come on, you turn morning. You turn morning to dancing. You get beauty for ashes. You turn shame.
held back the waters for my release. Oh, Yahweh, you're the God who fights for me, Lord of every victory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You have torn apart the sea, you have laid Guiding light to my feet You found me, you freed me Held back the waters for my release Oh Yahweh You're the God who fights for me Lord of every victory Hallelujah Hallelujah
that's how I fight my battles And this is how I fight my battles And I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you and I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. The battle belongs to you, Lord. Father, I thank you that this is how I fight my battles. God, surrendering over every flaw, every weakness that I feel I have, God, to you and your presence, this is how I fight my battles. God, I surrender them to you. The circumstances, the situations in my life where I feel like I may be losing, that you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good and for the benefit of your kingdom. And God, I thank you that I can walk in victory I can walk in victory in battles that I haven't even stepped into yet, God, because of your provision, because of your promise, because of your faithfulness. God, I thank you that that's how I fight my battles. Father, I thank you that you sustain me through my fights, that you sustain me through those times, oh God. And we give you all the praise. We give you all the glory because you deserve it. Can we give him a hand clap of praise this morning? to what we really do. Um, once a year we have a youth conference and this was part of our worship. Um, all the different lights, this is the first time we've been able to use any of this. You all can be seated if you would like, sorry. Um, it was just an amazing time here. Um, we had three different churches here. Um, the whole worship team consisted of people that have uh, grown up at the church. Uh, it was just, it was awesome. And um, we brought in one of the best speakers ever. We're kind of fond of him. He is our favorite. We won't tell anybody else that when they come, but he is our favorite. Um, out at the table, he has um, some books. This is his newest book he just wrote. And it tells you anything you need to know about this generation, uh, the millennials, the Gen Z, everything. This is what he does. He goes in depth with everything. Um, there's still some out at the table. Uh, our youth kind of cleared it out yesterday. They were buying it up. He also has hats. Um, the book is 15, the hats are 15. But the thing is, none of this goes to him. He uh, supports human trafficking, so every bit of uh, everything that sells goes to human trafficking. So um, you can find me out at the table afterwards, and we can get you hooked up with some um, fun items. So we would like to welcome Jeff Grinnell. There he is. I love South Bend. I really do. How many of you know that you are seated in a historic setting? You are. You have come to a, uh, to a place that has had moments that have shaped this country. What has happened in this building has changed the religious 
and the cultural landscape of America. <laughs> Just Google it and read the history of this great place, right? Those of you that have been here for like a while, old people, <laughs> that's how we say it today, right? You've been here a while. Right, you know what I'm talking about because what you just saw on the screen happened this weekend. You've seen it happen many times, many times in this place. Amen. And now we're just asking God to do it again. I love this place. I love your pastor. We are like brothers. We've known each other too long. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, really, it it is uh, a privilege to be here. I love this place, and I believe that your greatest days are in front of you. There's a few of us who believe that, I guess. Okay, that's, that's cool. <laughs> I believe your greatest days are in front of you. I know it. I believe it. In the church, to be honest, the church in America, I believe her greatest days are in front of her. Because I have heard... All over the country, I have heard this, that right before COVID hit, churches were on a rise. Churches were going through some of their greatest moments in 2020. And then this all came and kind of paused us, right? And showed us how important meeting is. Now, we know, we know that we don't come to church, we are the church. <laughs> Right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try this side over here because that side had it, that side had it. We know that we don't just come to church, we are the church. Yes, yes, yeah. If someone just screamed and that scared you, sorry. <laughs> All right, and thank you for joining us online too. We have many households that are joining us online, 30 or 40 households last week. So that represents so many more people who are a part of this place. And uh, if you would, would you go in your Bibles and, uh, to Ephesians chapter 6? Ephesians chapter 6. While you do that, I want to thank the youth ministry here for their efforts, their organization, their work, and all of the, all of the work that went into this weekend and uh, led by Sherry and her team. Would you give them a, a blessing applause right now to the kind of work that goes into that? They are, they are raising up the next generation well, okay? They're raising up the next generation very well, and you can be proud of the youth ministry here. I, I would like to just uh, correct maybe one thing. A as you get uh, the, the, the merch and buy all the stuff at that table, I am not supporting human trafficking. <laughs> I just, I don't know if anybody caught that, and I know Sherry understands that too <laughs> but <laughs> anyway I, some of you are like what I don't get it right so yeah I'm not that guy right anyway <laughs> yeah now I just sold out <laughs> um, I would like to say we have a parents thing this evening too I know pastor is probably going to hit that at the end of this morning here as we close but um, Wednesday night I came in and we did a parent session and so because I was not a very good parent we're gonna do a parent session tonight and learn from all of my mistakes okay <laughs> so don't miss that at 630 and um, I'd love to have you here Ephesians chapter 6 I want to talk to you today about a message entitled supernatural listen Christianity is nothing if it is not supernatural Christianity is nothing if it is not supernatural. It wouldn't exist. You could take out the 80 plus miracles in the Old Testament. You could take out the uh, over 90 miracles in the New Testament. And the Bible wouldn't be the same. Our lives wouldn't be the same. Isn't it interesting that even Jesus said, Greater works you will do than I did. But when we talk about the supernatural, we talk about signs and wonders and miracles, it almost freaks the church out. I I'm telling you the truth. 
Because the world is familiar with the supernatural, but the church is foreign to it. We almost apologize for the supernatural. Oh, well, I'm sorry. We didn't mean to, you know, hello? How many know God's presence is supernatural? It's a, it, it's a, it, it is an insurmountable thing to even think about God himself. Well, I'll attempt to do that, but look at Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6. We could read like 10 all the way through, but um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop and just uh, help you to see like verse 12. That, that's kind of the basis of the message. But if you had your, if you put notes in your, in your scripture there, just go like 10 to 19 or 10 to 20, but I'm going to pull one out. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, this age, okay, that we're in now. Uh, uh, possibly assuming there were many ages, okay? Uh, I just confuse those of you that have never taken or done well in science. Against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And so what Paul is doing is he's defining the natural in the spiritual. Listen, if you can overcome in the spiritual, your life will be free. Your life will have liberty if you can overcome in the spiritual. Because most of us spend most of our time trying to overcome in the natural. Trying to eat right. Trying to sleep right. Trying to exercise. Trying to... Uh, uh, just f deal with relationships and drama, okay? Most of us spend m most of our time in the natural when we, when we really need to understand the power of the supernatural. Because if we can understand and if we can comprehend, okay, and if we can operate in and win in the supernatural, everything else is going to fall into place. It really will. It's, it's an amazing thing. And I think you'll see that as we walk through this. Christianity is nothing if it is not supernatural. I want you to write down also Genesis 1, Genesis 1, Job 38 to 41. Okay, so Genesis 1. Those of you that are taking notes and going to heaven, I'll slow down a little bit. Did you catch that? <laughs> That was a jab. Okay, that was that was not fair. Don't worry. I won't be here next week. Okay, you can you can have him back um, Job 38 to 41 and then Revelation 22 and basically what I'm trying to show you is from the beginning to the end the scriptures are supernatural from Genesis to Revelation From the family tree to the maps in the back. I don't know all of it is supernatural so let me let me let me go there real quick I'm gonna ask you three questions question number one well if it, this is all supernatural then if God created Genesis chapter 1 I'll read that if God created the heavens and the earth then who created God <laughs> you're right I'm sure your middle schooler or your elementary son or daughters asked you that right well, I want you to think about this. It would be an absolutely incoherent argument to think that God needed to be created. If God created everything else, then who created God? You can't ask that question. Because it really has no answer. The beginning, if, if you were to say something like, because there is an infinite God who created God, you would have to say, well, a God to the second power or a God to the third power. Infinitely, you would have to say, then who created the God to the third power, right? It is an, in, it is an inestimable argument. You, you understand that? So what we have to assume then is that God existed in his own state. In his own time, God existed. 
And it all began, hear me, for us with faith. Fortunately, science has confirmed it. I'll get to that in a minute. But it all began for us with faith. That God existed. Because if you try to find his creator, it is ad infinitum. Because then who created the second one? Who created the third one? So we have to assume that by faith, God existed in a state by himself. Which then makes him powerful enough to answer all of these other questions. Question number two. Think about this. Why is God so sovereign? Why is, as we say as Christians, why is Yahweh? You're saying that in, your, in our worship. Why is Yahweh sovereign? Why couldn't somebody, right, one of the millions of Hindu gods be sovereign? Why, how, how about, right, people create their own? Think about that. Why is God sovereign? Well, I believe it's really simple also, like answering the first question. Why is Yahweh sovereign? Because he defined creation. Can't find this anywhere else. And even science confirmed. Listen, if God defined it, science has confirmed it. Think about it. Think about it this way. When God created everything, he created time. He, God created space. God created matter. When the Bible talks about the expanse of the universe, read, just read through Genesis 1 and 2, and then into Job 38 and 41, and then into Revelation, the expanse and the universe, all from the beginning of the Bible to the end. When God defined that, created that, when God defined uh, 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 water, oceans, deserts, land. When God defined nations and cities and people and rivers, you can go back, hear me, you can go back and see, you can visit them today. You think he just made this up? Listen, the scriptures have withstood the test of argument before you and me. You think we're the first ones to go, hmm, <laughs> And so why is God sovereign? Because he created creation and science and history has confirmed it. it. Listen, if the Bible lied about the people of Israel, if the Bible lied about Mount Horeb, if the Sinai, if the Bible lied about Israel or Egypt or, right? Then why would it lie about everything else? Because we can go back through the history of time and confirm God's creation. Question number three. Okay, so we've dealt with God's creation and his existence as a state, as a person, persona, in the Trinity. We've defined the fact that God has worked in creation and he is sovereign, Yahweh is sovereign. Then what about eternity and life after this. I'm sure you've thought about that. What about the space-time continuum? What about the supernatural aspect that we are eternal beings some going somewhere? <laughs> Hello. Yeah, yeah, you just excited me. Thank you so much. <laughs> Because I really love, I had that point highlighted in my notes. What about the possibility, right, that you will exist forever? Have you ever thought about that? Somewhere. Think about this. Revelation 22 is a description of eternity. Really, Genesis 1, Job 38 to 41 and all of Revelation, man, read Revelation 4 and 5. 
I hear people say all the time in the church. Well, you know, that's just emotionalism. We spent, you know, whatever thousand dollars on lights and smoke and, you know, that's just, no, let me tell you what emotionalism is. Walking into eternity for the first time. <laughs> Have you ever thought about that? Just read Revelation 4 and 5, and it defines this worship scene in heaven. I ain't seen no crystal glass here. I ain't seen no flying creatures that can't stop day and night saying holy, holy, holy. I ain't seen that here. I, I haven't seen creatures flying through the air with eyes all about. We, we've not seen thunderings and lightnings, peals of thunder, right, that take place in Revelation 4 and 5, talking about eternity in heaven. That is supernatural. This is simply our natural attempt to come to God. Think about this. Eternity. Eternity was marked by God's presence. His presence, hear me, from the beginning of human history. Until the end of this era and this age. And the next one begins for you somewhere. There is this incredible warning in Revelation 22. If you were to go there and read this, I'm not going to take the time to read it, but there's this incredible warning at the very end of the Bible that says this. John, the apostle, wrote this book and had this vision of Christ coming to him and unfolding these words in Revelation about eternity. And at the end, he says these words. If anyone adds to them, or if anyone takes away. Hello? Your little finite mind can't even wrap itself around canonicity. But, yeah. Uh, let me define that. Canonicity is what holds this together. The canon. Certain things had to take place for it to even be in here. Sometimes we skip that and we start saying things like, well, it really didn't mean that. He hello. It really didn't mean that because I don't feel that. Listen, you don't have a choice. <laughs> we don't have a choice to say, I like that, but I don't like this. Okay? Because it's sovereign. You don't change science over at, the, over at the University of Notre Dame because you feel like it. You don't change scripture or truth because you feel like it. See, most of us are mesmerized by culture, but we're not memorizing scripture. And most of us are run by culture and our own finite thinking. Hear me, think about this. The last five months, did you waste it? Did you waste the last five months of being alone with your family? Did, did, did we somehow miss this moment? Because hopefully we will never get this back. Grateful that we have five months left to redeem what we lost in the spring and summer. Hello? Because 2020 doesn't have to end the way it began. And what, what has to take place is this, it's really simple. We have to become a generation that understands theology again. Because hear me, God is not intimidated by your ignorance. <laughs> okay. Or, or your wisdom, okay. God is not intimidated by science. God is not intimidated by the natural and certainly not by the supernatural. I've worked with young people who have been bound by, by years of supernatural powers over their life. Of addictions over their life. Someone has said, in America, we don't, there's no Satanism in, in America. 
There's no, come on, deliverance in America. We don't need deliverance in America. No, in, in, in one way is I understand what you're saying. We've done a pretty good job ruining ourselves. <laughs> the devil didn't make you do that. You did it, okay. <laughs> but I want you to know behind all of that is the deception of a lack of theology. Because most of us couldn't even define God this week to a coworker. Can I prove that? Can I give you facts and not just opinions? The grandmas and grandpas in this place had a biblical worldview that, that ran in the 60%, 62 to 65%. They thought biblically. Then they had kids, which were the Gen X, so the silence were like that 60, the silent generation, 60 to 60, 62%, somewhere around there. Then you, they had kids called uh, Gen X. Sorry. Gen X dropped in half down into the 30% biblical worldview. They thought about the world from a biblical perspective just at a third percentage. Then Gen Xers had the millennials. Sorry. <laughs> and the millennials dropped into the teens thought biblically about the world through a biblical perspective into the teens, 14, 18%. And then we had the next generation who, are, who I'm a part of. <laughs> That's Gen Z. That's the teenagers today. The biblical worldview that teenagers today think in is 4%. Barna Research, pewforum.com read it. There are books, and it's in my book in the back, if you, how we have gone from this, this godful to this godless society. And let me tell you why. Because our families aren't reading the word. Our families aren't worshiping together. And some places, our churches have thrown this out also for ideology and not theology. Well, I feel, and I think, and so it must be There is this incredible supernatural work of God in all of history. Look at biblical history. As I said, almost 200 recorded miracles in the scriptures. About 190 or so. Think about that. The story of God the narrative of Christianity is supernatural. Why would we then not be living that way today? The supernatural causes a pastor to buy a telescope and look into the heavens every night. <laughs> Ask him about that. Hear me. God is not intimidated by your questions. God is not intimidated by your searching or your wondering. God is not intimidated by you stretching your mind and asking the question. No, God is not intimidated by that because he began it all. And our thinking falls within the frame of his creation. Think of the miracles throughout scripture that are inexplainable. Moses crossing the Red Sea with 600,000 people. Okay, I know some people say, well, no, those that was 6,000. Okay, think of Moses crossing the Red Sea with 6,000. Okay, yeah. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Forget all that. Just think of Moses crossing the Red Sea on dry ground. Oh, okay, okay, I've got one for you too there. No, I know what they say. They say, mm, no, that wasn't really the Red Sea. It was the smaller part of the right that was, you know, really low at that time of the year also. That, that's what they say. That's what the finite mind says, right? Okay, I'll give you that, even though that's not true. But let's go there. Then how did he drown all of the Egyptian armies in a pool? Oh, oh. <laughs> Oops. What about 
Daniel and his friends in the lion's den, in the furnace of fire? What about the prophets and the incredible miracles that the prophets did? And then Jesus comes to, to fulfill those miracles and takes them to a whole nother level. What about Mary and the immaculate conception and, and a teenager? We could walk through all of these workings of signs and wonders and miracles in the scriptures and almost feel like it is history. I remember when. Remember the story when. But let me tell you something. God is not just working in biblical history. God is working today. I don't know if you've seen a miracle. Uh, you, probably you have seen many and you just didn't know it. Or you explained it away as a coincidence. Yeah, that's true. It's true. So, can, can I just encourage your faith for a moment? Okay, hold. It is 11th. It is not 11th. Okay. I got to shorten this up because I just want to brag on. I just want to brag on God for a minute, okay? We have a, we have, we had a son. Well, I, I have a son, okay, <laughs> still. He was in middle school and he struggled with uh, massive warts all over his left hand. And... Uh, we tried everything for two years in middle school to get rid of it because it was an eyesore that would break open. He was a football player. He was a linebacker. And so, you know, in the, in the cold in the fall, he would crack it on helmets, even, if, even having gloves on, right? And it would break open, and they, they were scarred. And in eighth grade, it really began to bother him. And so we tried chemical. We tried treatments. We tried oils. We tried everything we could, doctors, the whole thing and it wouldn't go away. And he came into high school, and they're going to start him up on, uh, on the varsity team. They're going to move him up now because he was really doing well, but he couldn't, fit, he couldn't practice at times. And so we're eating, and he's a freshman in high school. We're eating at the table, and we, I, this frustration just sets in. And he's got bandages on his hand, and he slams his hand down, and he says, I'm tired of this. I don't know. Uh-oh. Uh I don't know about you. We've already prayed. We've already fasted. We've already poured oil all over his hand. We've done it all, okay? We doctored the whole thing. But here comes the moment. We, we didn't complain, and we didn't quit, and we didn't leave the church because of that. Because God didn't show up the way we wanted him to. Maybe he was doing something in anyway. So in that moment, my wife, Jane, and some of you know her. Uh, she's really behind the scenes. She passed away five years ago, but before that, she really was behind the scenes. And she stood up and said, everyone, let's pray. And she went over to the cupboard and got the oil out, poured it on his hand, and she went off. And we believed, and six days later, not a scar, six, not seven, not one day, six days later, not a scar, nothing the rest of his life. Tell me that's not supernatural. We had multiple miracles in our home. They're going through my mind right now. I could tell you the story of how the Holy Spirit saved my daughter's life by giving her a word on the highway to stop, pull her car. It's an incredible story. She wasn't going to at first, driving after men, pulls over, stops, and the Holy Spirit just began to speak to her on the highway, on the highway, not off, on an ex. And this truck goes flying by. And the Holy Spirit in that moment said, you can go again. And she was like stunned and looked over God. Not a mile, within a mile down the road, all these red lights. And there'd been this massive accident uh, out in front and this semi smashed into all of them she came home trembling walks in and says mom and dad the Holy Spirit saved my life that is supernatural a word of wisdom a word of knowledge one of the gifts 
I remember speaking in a camp in Michigan just three years ago. And there's a girl there, who, a high school girl, who, had, who was deathly, deathly allergic to peanuts. And she couldn't do certain things. She was allergic to certain pollens. And so she couldn't be running around in the fields and playing at camp with all these kids. She came up on this one night where we were doing healings. And she came forward and they prayed for her and nothing. She didn't feel nothing. You know, nothing was uh, noticeably different. Until the Holy Spirit spoke to her and said, you are healed. And she turned to her friends and she said, I just f heard this voice. Did one of you say, and they're like, no, I mean, we're praying for you. But she said, I just heard the Holy Spirit say to me, you are healed. And so she said, come with me. <laughs> oh, boy. Some of you are ahead of me, right? <laughs> I know that guy is because he's ran these things for, I'm the speaker. And I'm thinking, mm, I did not just hear that story. That I was not speaking at that camp, okay. And she grabs her friends. They run back to her cabin. And she says to them, uh, feed me peanuts. Uh-oh. <laughs> I didn't know this was happening, okay, at the time. I didn't hear this until after. And they, they're like, are you sure? And the youth pastor's wife is with them. And she's like, no, 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 we're not doing this. And she pleaded with them. And they're like, okay, one. And she eats one and nothing. She would have swollen up immediately. And she eats this handful. And they're crying. They're in the cabin. And they're jumping up and down. They call her mother. Share this with her mother. And her mother's like, you did what? I mean, praise God, you know. <laughs> That's a, right, I don't know. And they come back into the service. And she's crying. And they bring her up over here to the left-hand side. They're like, mister, mister. And I'm like, well, hang on. We're doing something important, right? And all of a sudden, I see this, and, and I go down there, and the youth pastor's wife tells me the story. And I'm like, what? And we can't share that. <laughs> Hello? Or like Matthew in Iowa, who had started psychedelic drugs from the time he was just a middle schooler. Sixth grade, living in an addict home. And he shows up to our meeting. And he has to have a friend with him the whole time because he's lost his equilibrium and his balance. He can't shake his head. His be he looks like he just came off the beaches of California, Matthew. This, this incredibly sharp young man. Loves God with his whole heart. Committed to this youth group. And he's now a junior in high school. And for the last five years, he's been rocked with dreams and uh, psychedelic visions and headaches, et cetera, and imbalance. And over here, off to the side, his youth group, uh, 40 or 50 kids are gathered around him and they're praying and not, nothing happens. And he goes and he sits back down. And one of his friends comes back, you know, an hour later and grabs him and they pray. Now they're all in the back and they're praying for him one more time as, as he's seated. And all of a sudden, this eruption comes from the back and he stands up. And he starts shaking his head, and they're all like, what's going? We've never seen him be able to do that. He's like, get away from me. And he starts moving and jumping, and he starts running through this auditorium, jumping up and down. And you see the, the kids all meet him over here, and he's crying, and they're hugging him. And I'm like, we got to have some of that. <laughs> and I go over, and I talk to them, and they tell me the story that I just told you. So I bring Matthew up on the top. And I'm like, Matthew, will you? I got my arm around him. I said, tell us what happened. And this is what he did. He leans forward and he's like, I don't know. This is, you know, I was born. <laughs> and he can't even put his words together. So I'm like, you know, I'll compose him and this is all good. He'll be good this time. Try it again. Again, he like, gets a word, a half a sentence, a phrase out. And he can't even finish because he's overwhelmed by the supernatural healing of God on his life. And just walked off and the place went crazy. Are you telling me that God can't move in your family the way he has moved from Genesis 1, the way he has moved in Job 38 to 41? Do you remember the conversation that Job and God had? He, he, hear me. God says to him, do, do you, tell me then, Job, if you've got this all figured out, you tell me. Where were you when I created the Pleiades and the Orion? Where were you when I spoke into existence the stars and the galaxies? 
Where were you when I said to the waves, this far and no more? Where were you when I carved out the land and I put a, a mountain here or a crevice there? Where were you? If you know, tell me. Right? You've, if you've ever read it, 64 questions that God asks Job. And Job has no answer. Job doesn't have an answer for where were you when the cub was born? H how about the snake and how it moves on the rock? Do you know how that happens? How about the, how about the lifting of the currents that I placed into the sky that, that come across the feathers of the eagle? Do you know how the eagle soars? Could I, do I need to go on? And then he closes the conversation like this. Job, Job, what about the beginning of your life and the end of it when you breathe your last? Can you explain that to me? And Job finally puts his hand over his mouth, symbolically, you can read it, and says, Almighty, I'm sorry that I couldn't even understand the expanse, insurmountable nature of you. And I've complained about my family being gone, and I've complained about my health, and I've complained about the loss of my cattle, and I've complained about my homes. I have to rebuild my farm I'm sorry he said I put my hand over my mouth maybe we need to do the same thing because when it comes down to Revelation chapter 22 the warning is that you cannot take away or add to his supernatural will you stand all across this place. God, I'm asking for you right now. In this moment, we don't need people to gather at an altar. We don't need prayer teams to get around people and agree with. Those days will come again. But I know this, that you can do anything. You can do anything because the supernatural is the heartbeat of God in us that draws us closer to the nature of God. Can I say that again? The supernatural draw of the Spirit in your life is what draws you to the nature of God. And I'm asking right now, God, that you will move by your spirit. I, I know that Jesus does not walk this earth right now. That's the Holy Spirit's role. That when Jesus left, he said, it is better for you that I leave so the Holy Spirit will come. Holy Spirit, would you show Christ to us? Would you move up into these aisles next to these people and calm their fears? Holy Spirit, would you bring peace into every row? Would you go with them back home? Would you be online right now as someone is seated on that couch or listening, walking around the room or at a table in the kitchen? Maybe they're at a coffee shop. Would you move into that moment right now and break them with your presence? Your supernatural presence. God, would you heal in families right now? How many of you in this room, online joining us, need a healing in your life? A healing. I want you to raise your hand. God, send the gift of the effecting of miracles right now. Will you reach out and believe him right now? Uh, it doesn't matter if you've prayed before and it never happened. 
your only responsibility is to pray one more time. God, heal right now. Surprise them. Would you surprise them? Break into history right now. Move across time and space into this online crowd right now and do it again. Do it again. Be whole in Jesus' name. Be whole in Jesus' name. How many of you need provision or an answer to prayer? Some, a job or a broken relationship, right, healed or drama going How many of you need God to work in that way? Come on, wait, wait, raise your hand. I'm not going to call you forward. God, move right now. Lord, would you provide two jobs tomorrow, this week? I, I pray that. Lord, not just an interview. Would you provide another call from another place? That, that person is filled out so, and they're looking right now. God, provide a choice of jobs. Go beyond what they've been asking. I pray that. Will you agree with that right now? Come on. God, provide right now. Pull that, pull that, that, that uh, business back together, Lord. They've been waiting for a, a, a check. Send it this week. Let it be there. Let it be there tomorrow. God, for broken relationships, would you heal right now? Would you heal? Right. Begin with me. Begin with me. I'm not asking to send somebody to me to apologize first. God, start it with me. Let me be the one that offers the forgiveness. God, touch minds, touch bodies, touch families. Lord, move in our schools and in our government. Oh God, oh God, oh God. Our government is so divided. We need an awakening. The awakenings that have been preached in this building for decades. Words from Smith Wigglesworth that said revival was going to take place from this place. In 1946, spoken over this place, God could we be the seed for that? Could we be the water to that seed? Send it across the Midwest. Let it run the course of, of, of the internet. Let it run the highways that, that, that are near this place, we ask. Lord, we're awakening it. I can even sense the wells that are being undug right now. Supernatural. We can't do this on our own, God. We cannot do this on our own. We cannot do this on our own. We cannot do this on our own. Lord, I pray for this pastor and this team. We extend your hands toward him right now, please. God, we extend our intercession and our prayer that you would give him breakthrough, that you would give him words, teachings, that you would give him wisdom and knowledge and understanding. God, send them in. Send them in. We'll take care of them. Send them in. Hundreds this year as so many are wondering where am I going to worship? What am I going to... God, send them here. Send them here. Send them here. Supernatural. Yes, we have responsibility to work, but supernaturally, send them here. I pray this, Lord. I pray this, Lord. I pray this, Lord. I pray this, Lord. I pray this, Lord.
Glad you came to church today. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Let me tell a tale on Jeff while I can. It was 1990, late 90s something. I don't remember the year. Um, Jeff's father was, uh, and his mom, they were elders in our church in Grand Rapids, and uh, his dad had to have a liver transplant. I believe that's what that organ was. Which, man, when you think about the survivability of a liver transplant, that's pretty, back then, you know. So, so he went through the surgery, but part of the healing process to come out and all those things is they put you in a suspended coma. And uh, so you're in there for a little while so your body can heal, and then they bring you out. And I got the message that Jeff's dad was going to come out, and I was in Grand Rapids. He was over in, all the way over in, um, in the U of M hospital, and so I went over there. And as I walked into that ICU room, tubes everywhere, you know, there's his dad. His dad was a sizable guy. He's a good guy. Laying in that bed, you know, real jaundice, and his mom's there, small woman, she's there. And I walked in there, and I thought, well, my job today is just to pray for this man and just, you know, thank God you made it. And so I went in, I anointed him with oil, and he was kind of, kind of groggy, sleepy, so I anointed him with oil, I laid my hand on him, I prayed for him, and I thought, I'm just going to pray and run, you know. And so I went in there, and of course, I, you touched him, his eyes opened up, my, I said, hi, let me pray for you. So I prayed for him, and uh, he kind of closed his eyes again, and then I, sit, then I gave his mom a hug, I turned to leave the, the hospital room, and she stopped me. And I'm like, oh, yes. And, and she says, well, you can't leave yet. I said, okay. All right. How you raise your family matters. Raise your family with a biblical worldview, and you will live in the supernatural. Because part of your life story will be nothing is impossible for God. Even if I wake up out of a coma and lift my eyes and there's one of my junior pastors of my church, she says, no, stop, stop, stop. I said, what? And he can't even speak. He's just breathless, clicking his teeth as he's, she's listening. She goes, he needs to pray for you. I don't know what you think about first moments out of a coma, but I don't think praying for the visiting minister would be on my priority list, but it was on his dad's. It was on his dad's. So you might look at somebody like Jeff and go, what happened? That's it's his dad's fault. That's what happened. All right. It's just the hand of God that, it's the hand of God that works in you and I, and he's no respecter of persons, and so that's why we stop, and I encourage you to slow down three times a day so that you can recalibrate your life and know today's a supernatural day. I'm going to spend time with God today so that we can make this thing work. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you so much, Lord. We just pray in faith together for every hand that went up for whatever the need was lord you know what they are and i pray that this truly will be a week of breakthrough a week of breakthrough father in their lives 
Lord, you're answering prayer every week around here, God, and we celebrate all that you're doing, Father, as we unveil it in the days ahead. Lord, you are moving powerfully. So we ask you, Jesus, to help us to live in this place and to know that all that we see is not the end. There's a story and a creator behind it all who's weaving our lives towards this glorious destiny, and you will walk with us. So, Father, go with us, I pray. If you're here today and this is your first time you ever heard a message like this, and you're like, I need to know this Jesus right where you're at right now, say, God, here I am. Here I am. You, you're supernatural. I want to know you. Here I am. Just reach out if you're watching online today. And you're like, wow, I want to know a God like that. Well, he already knows you, and he'll reveal himself because he says, if you will seek me with all your heart, you'll find me. He doesn't hide from you. Just look for him, and you'll find him. So, man, just say, God, here I am today. I surrender my life to you. You are the Lord. I believe in you today. Today I step into that faith and I declare I believe in you today. Is that anybody in this room today you'd say, yes, that's me. I step into that faith today and at home. This is your day. This is your moment. Yes, this is your moment. So I'm excited, God. So Lord, let this be a glorious week as we walk with you, and we cannot wait to see what you'll do through our lives. In Jesus' powerful name, and all God's people said, amen. Tonight, 6.30, back here. All you parents, or if you're a grandparent, this would be good for you to know. Tonight, we talk about trends in youth. What's going on in our generation, it's really going to be good. Jeff's going to be here one hour. Invest in your family. We'll see you back tonight. God bless you guys. We love you. Have an awesome day. Have an awesome day. We love you.